session on responsible community governance, equity, and access to mental health information on Wikimedia projects. Um, Praveen, could you advance to the next slide? My name is Stella Ng, and I am the senior manager of the Trust in Safety Policy team over here at the Wikimedia Foundation. I'm currently located in San Francisco, and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, my team primarily handles the work on the UCOC, as well as work on um, the emergency at workflow within the foundation. And I'm very happy to be joined by quite a few panelists on my end. I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Dr. Monica Horton and all of the other panelists to give their intro, but let's just go in the order of the panelists that are there. Uh, well, hello, um, I'm Dr. Monica Horton. I am the policy manager for freedom of expression at the Open Rights Group here in the UK. I have some 15 years experience of, of researching in the field of content online policy. Uh, and I have worked with the um, Council of Europe um, on uh, freedom of expression and human rights um, online. I'm um, currently based in, in London and my focus is on the online safety bill, which is a new law being uh, currently put through uh, the Westminster Parliament. And it is with the intention of um, tackling um, harmful content online. Awesome. Passing the mic on to Dr. Hussein, could you give a quick intro to yourself as well before we get started? My name is Nata Hussein. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, I'm a medical doctor and I have been a Wikimedian for the last 12 years. On Wikipedia, I usually write articles related to healthcare. Uh, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, I wrote several articles related to COVID-19, particularly related to the misinformation content um, of COVID-19. Uh, in 2020, I also launched the vaccine safety project where I was involved in mapping and bridging the knowledge gaps related to vaccine uh, vaccines and vaccine safety. Um, outside of Wikimedia, I'm a medical doctor and a radiologist working in Sweden, and I'm originally from India. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Tina, would you like to give a quick intro to yourself? Sure. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tina Butoyu, and I am a lawyer here at the Wikimedia Foundation. Most of my work focuses on harmful content. Recently, I've also been working on the UK online safety bill, and I also work on producing the biannual transparency report. And then so sorry, everyone who is viewing the slides. We are missing one panelist. Praveen, could you please give a quick intro to yourself as well? Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Praveen Das. Um, I'm a senior, uh, senior partnerships manager for South Asia region, and I'm based in Lucknow. Um, most of my uh, partnership focus in this, currently in this region, and uh, primarily I'm close to mental health. Hence, I'll be uh, you know, talking something today about Thank you so much. All right, just want to take a brief pause to let attendees know you guys can submit questions at any time during this session, and we will be trying to get to as many questions as we can. I have the Etherpad open in another um, tab, so I will be looking at that throughout the presentation. But with that, let's advance to the next slide. All right, let's talk legal definitions of harmful content and access to information. I'd love to hear from Dr. Horton just about your experience legally with harmful content and what types of definitions you would say fall under that scope. You're muted, just as a quick FYI. Okay. Oh, I can hear you. Know. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, Stella, um, for that introduction. Um, although you might think it is easy to define harmful, harmful content, it is actually quite difficult uh, to define it in a way that is legally watertight. Um, and in the UK, uh, I think we are struggling with this a bit. We have a proposed new law, which is called the Online Safety Bill, and it introduces a concept of harm uh, in relation to online content, and it asks um, online platforms and other internet services to remove or take down or restrict that content. 
Um, so it's quite important how we define it. But when you ask what it means, the first thing you actually get is a long list. Um, and the list may include things like eating disorders, anorexia, suicide, online abuse. Um, the harmful content is actually divided into two categories, uh, but these are legal categories. So in one context, you're talking about illegal content, so content that is against the law, content that reflects a criminal offence. And illegal content is defined by criminal defences in UK law, and there are some 28 criminal offences altogether that the law specifies. These 28 offences include harassment and stalking, financial fraud, terrorism, child sexual abuse, and assisting suicide, and also assisting illegal immigration. So you can see quite a wide variety of things. Not a lot of definition, though. Um, the other content, um, type of harmful content is known as often referred to as legal but harmful content. This is content which is not um, covered under criminal law, um, but is nevertheless considered harmful and where the government considers it desirable that the online platforms remove this content or restrict, um, restrict it or restrict the user's accounts in some way. So in this context, you get eating disorders, um, online abuse, anorexia, and what is defined as legal suicide. But nowhere do we actually see what this content looks like in a, in a Facebook post or a Twitter post or Instagram post. There are no guidelines on how the platforms should actually identify this content. And there, um, so the law should tell the platforms what exactly they are supposed to be taking down, but it doesn't. And similarly, um, the users need to know what it is they can and cannot say. But in fact, they don't know that. There's not a lot more definition um, than what I've given you here. Um, and for example, if you look at um, the illegal content for assisting suicide, you get told that it is um, section two of the 1961 Suicide Act, um, which is about assisting or encouraging suicide. And that's it. But what does that post look like? What's supposed to be taken down? What is it that you're allowed to say? We still don't really know. Um, one of the, the big problems that comes up is when you're talking about linked content, because as you know, users on social media generally like to link to content. They might link to Wikipedia and say, here's something that you ought to know in this post. Um, but the question really is, how are these links treated? So for example, if the are they are taking down the content put up by the actual platform or are they taking that content down put up by a user of that platform and therefore what does that mean what you tend to find is that when platforms decide to take something down they don't just take it down in one place they take it down everywhere they can possibly find it using ai to, to identify it and this raises real concerns for the sites who are being linked to a lot so any sites that rely on links for people to find them, which um, might be Wikipedia or it might be your source material in Wikipedia. Um, how do those, those websites and source thing, um, sites know that their content is being um, removed or, or demoted or restricted in some way? And what can they do about it? Um, at the moment, the, the law actually says very little um, about that. Interesting. I want to follow up on a, on a point that you just made, just because you're bringing up a lot of examples in which the definition isn't very clear or slightly amorphous. Based on your experience working on this, how do legal definitions align or conflict with the right to freedom of expression globally, just given it is a bit ambiguous? Um, in this case, it is deeply problematic because um, I, will, I will take the right to freedom of expression under the European Convention on Human Rights, which is the one I'm, I'm most familiar with. Um, and on the European Convention, you have a two-way right. So you have a right to, to express yourself, but you also have a right to access information um, on the one hand. And you also, um, the, when you, under Article 10.2 of the Convention, so Article 10 is the right to freedom of expression. Um, Article 10 has a second paragraph, Article 2, part which, which talks about um, 
how states should go about restricting content if they are going to do so. And it is actually very clear. It says the law must be clear and precise as to what it is you are restricting. The law should define clearly. And in courts, that's sometimes actually defined as precise URL. So when you get this very broad stuff, like you get a criminal offence where we don't know what it actually looks like in, in terms of content, that becomes problematic because how is the platform supposed to know what is that offence? Um, and I have an example um, from another area, which is um, terrorism content, where our um, reviewer of terrorism here in the UK, he said, look, you've got, um, you've got somebody um, giving a, a training in rifle shooting online. Now, that could be somebody training someone with a view to them undertaking a terrorist activity, but also it could be something completely innocent. It could be just a rifle, a sports club that does rifle shooting and it's legal and you know it's okay. So how does the platform though supposed to define between those two things? So we that that is where we end up with, with the problem. The law wants it to be clear and precise. Uh, sorry, human rights law wants it to be clear and precise. This law, the online safety bill, is very, very far from being clear and precise. Interesting. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Tina. I mean, based on these definitions, how does it conflict with emerging research on what is harmful to readers? Yeah, so it's it's tricky because in the online safety bill, harm includes both physical and psychological harm that, that amounting to at least serious distress. But we know from emerging research that across culturally harm is uh, is what qualifies as harm across cultures and languages, as well as lived experiences, is, is different. And how people in different countries and across cultures uh, rate the severity of, uh, of harm uh, of certain content, it also differs. So for example, in the US, we know pro-anorexia content is problematic as, you know, uh, based on the, um, and we've seen how Instagram in, misuse their algorithms from the Francis Hogan uh, revelations. But uh, Americans perceive pre-anarchia content as less severe than other types of, of content. That's where it gets complicated. But in other countries, uh, I think in Southeast Asia, suicide-related content is, is higher on severity than in the US. So uh, one of the issues with online safety legislation globally is that regulators with a particular bias and perspective are charged with enforcing these laws and may have blind spots with respect to the types of harms recognized and experienced by folks around the world. Interesting. I want to drill a bit more into that. I mean, what principles does the foundation take into consideration related to harmful content? So what we have is uh, at the foundation is, as you all know, the foundation is based in the U.S. Um, so U.S. law always applies and will take into account the laws of California and Florida um, since we were based, we're headquartered in California. Oh, sorry, Tina. Um, if we could slow down a bit, it looks like we've gotten a comment in chat just to that it's a bit fast at the moment. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Natasha. So uh, the way we evaluate harmful content or whether an international law applies to us as the Wikimedia Foundation, since we are a US-based organization, is applying uh, three factors. One, we evaluate the law issue and see if it applies to the specific case and whether geographic jurisdiction also applies. Next, we evaluate whether the case presents a risk to the foundation or the movement. And these risks include, but are not limited to, risks to editor safety, risks of project blocking or similar technical disruption, and also monetary risks. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, we, do a, we conduct a human rights analysis. So we evaluate whether the uh, whether a law conflicts with existing human rights norms in accordance with our human rights policy. Interesting. How effective are community moderation processes? Just uh, brief pause. Um, Natasha, am I going too fast for you as well? Would you like for me to slow down? No, it's not you, it's uh, Tina, because what she says is very interesting to me as a Wikipedia okay. editor to know how the foundation evaluates uh, harmful content. And she starts slowly, but then it goes very, very quickly. And I'm not used to American accent, I'm used to the English accent. So I have problems understanding 
uh, Americans when they speak, if it goes too quickly, sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry to pester you. And uh, probably there are other people from other countries who would not be as bold as me and daring to, to say, go speak fast. Well, thank you so much for that feedback, everyone. Um, this is why it's important that we have feedback from community members from around the world, because some of, sometimes we're not aware of what we do uh, just automatically. My apologies for, <laughs> no, no worries. I, I really appreciate that. And it actually highlights why we need to have an ongoing conversation about harmful content is sometimes we edit or we do things uh, in ways that make sense to us without realizing that others around the world may experience maybe the way we speak or what we say differently. So uh, I'm actually really glad that you brought this up, Natasha. Uh, yeah, so the main point of, of how we evaluate harmful content is one, we evaluate the law. We always, everything is done on a case by case basis. So we look at a complaint and then we examine the law itself often with the help of outside counsel, local expert um, outside counsel. And we see if the law applies, but also if we're subject to a country's jurisdiction. Next, we also just look at what risks. Do we have folks on the ground? Do we have assets? What risks does a, compl uh, a complaint or an issue bring to us, um, present to the foundation? And then third, we're always committed to human rights. And that's why we conduct a human rights analysis. And when we, if we identify that that law conflicts with human rights, then we, uh, we will take that into account whether we comply or not. Again, each case is uh, evaluated on, we make these evaluations on a case by case basis. So it's hard to predict when we will take content down. But um, I think the most important part is to realize that we have, uh, that we do take into account human rights and uh, and when we're looking at online safety legislation, that is something that our public policy and global advocacy team very much uh, work with regulators and legislators to, to address. All right, we've gotten a question in from the chat. Could you please drill down or explain a bit more about human rights analysis? Yes, so um, our human rights policy came out last year in 2021. And there are, so Article 19 of the International Convention on Covenant on Civil and Political Rights says individuals have the right to access uh, information and to, act, to, to share and impart information. We also recognize the right to privacy, which is recognized, which is essential to the right to, which is part of the right to freedom of expression. So if you see our transparency report, um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for, for sharing the link to our, to our policy. That's where we go in more in depth. We take into account how community members and how the foundation's human rights will be affected in, uh, when evaluating whether to comply with the law. And when it comes to privacy, we collect very little data, but some, in some countries uh, where there's heavy surveillance, we do our best to protect the rights of our users over there. Thank you so much, Tina. Just noting to all of the attendees, I am keeping a track of the questions that are being asked on Etherpad. We will be going over those at the end of the session. And if we do not have the time to reach your question, we will try to answer it asynchronously. Praveen, next slide, please. All right, with this, I'd like to drill down deeper into Wikimedia projects as a global resource for mental health information. Dr. Hussein, I'd love for you to get started on this. Just based on your personal and professional experiences, how would you describe mental health and suicide and how they're perceived in different countries? Yeah, from my experience, I could definitely say that um, how suicide is perceived depends on your background, your culture, and where you come from. Um, we know we have some previous research so showing that when it comes to gender, um, in, in countries where uh, there is so much patriarchal influence, women are more likely to uh, try to end their life and think about suicide ideation. And, it, and how you perceive suicide also depends on which culture you come from. 
there are cultures where you are stigmatized overtly. You are just stigmatized just for ideating related to suicide. And there are also some subcultures where suicide is glorified when your suicide is for a greater good, perhaps for spreading the ideology or um, um, or, or committing uh, or ending your own life as a part of a holy war and so forth. And there are certain religions where it's absolutely forbidden to take your own life. And uh, in some cultures or in the people with uh, lower socioeconomical status, we know that social and economic challenges often lead them to think about uh, ending their own life. Um, so how you perceive suicide is a multi a multifaceted and a very complex issue. And I think it has very different, You depending upon where you come from and what do you, uh, your background, there is um, a lot of difference uh, in the way you perceive it. When it comes to Wikimedia, you have just one article, you, you have like one article about one aspect of suicide. Say if you take the article about suicide on English Wikipedia, you probably are likely to write in a way that is suitable for the Western audience. And, and my, I would like for the article to be more diverse when it comes to like addressing the challenges of people from all backgrounds and cultures. I want to drill down on something you mentioned about stigmatization, just in one of the first points you brought up. So research has stated, specifically the WHO or the World Health Organization, has stated that raising or addressing stigma and raising awareness is important to preventing suicide. They've also stated that improving community and online environments can help improve child and adolescent mental health. Do you have any thoughts about that? Definitely. I think there is so much that Wikipedia can do. I think the whole the Wiki, Wikimedia movement can do in terms of um, like raising awareness related to suicide. Um, we are the largest health related encyclopedia. We are the largest encyclopedia in the world. And we also have the largest health related encyclopedia content. So I think, and we are also one of the most visited healthcare related uh, information on the internet. So this gives us some responsibility when it comes to providing content to our readers. Um, because anything that we write out there, it could be, like shared and amplified in different ways. Um, so we have to be very careful about what we are presenting um, in terms of like, in terms of what articles we show to our um, readers. So I would like for more expert involvement uh, in this area so that Wikimedia content is more and more reliable and updated. I would like for the knowledge gaps on Wikipedia to be fixed so that when people look for information and they don't see it on Wikipedia, I don't want them to go further and go into other websites that provide them misinformation. I would also like for Wikipedia articles not to be overtly academic. Uh, we are, um, as Wikimedians, we are very interested in writing everything in a very academic way. But when it comes to suicide, I think we also have to think about in a person writing in a person centered way so that we take into account of the emotional challenge that is also gone through by um, people who have um, attempted to take their own life. Um, we also want our articles to be written in a holistic way, not to focus overtly on a person's how a person tried to end their own life or uh, focus overtly on the graphic recording um, stopped uh, graphic content of how um, how a certain person um, ended their life and so forth so when we write an article about say by a person who ended their life we have to be very careful about how we describe it in a person-centered way so that um, the readers um, can um, it, it's possible for the readers to understand the fact, but not overtly to focus it in a way that helps, a way that promotes uh, uh, promotes them to um, actually take their own life as well. So these are some of the thoughts um, that I have about this. Thank you so much for providing your thoughts. I mean, just going into a bit more detail, I wanna give Praveen a moment, a chance, a moment to speak. Um, Praveen, if you'd like to weigh in, what role do you think Wikimedia projects more broadly have to address stigma and raise awareness about mental health and suicide? Okay, I think um, 
you know, when it comes to Wikipedia, as Dr. Hussain uh, mentioned, it is one of the most frequently visited resource for uh, health information on internet. And it's a global source of seeking mental health information. But then again, when it comes to suicide and self-harm, you know, these are very complex issues, uh, uh, which is caused by mixed uh, you know, factors. So as part of the project and as part of uh, you know, responsible uh, community, I think we should be more, uh, 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 more uh, you know, sympathetic and also be very cautious while writing anything related to suicide and suicide prevention and build more repositories of mental health on Wikimedia projects um, in general, be it Wikimedia Commons or um, you know, Wikipedia. Textual and image repositories are gonna help build more resources for uh, you know, seeking, um, self, uh, seeking help uh, you know, uh, for those people who, uh, who wanted to commit suicide. Thank you so much. What do you think are the challenges in doing this or implementing this? I think there are a wide variety of challenges when it comes to uh, you know mental health. These are a very sensitive topic, and uh, uh, you know we may need more editors from uh, uh, you know the background who understand mental health very well, or uh, you know we can organize some uh, uh, some workshops. Uh, to encourage, uh, you know, and encourage participation to learn more about mental health, so that uh, you know uh, the communities uh, they themselves can write really well. Also, other challenges are in in general, you know, um, uh, so lack of research in third world countries. So when it comes to uh, you know when it comes to developed countries, there would be more uh, you know initiatives towards mental health. But when it comes to uh, not so developed countries, uh, there are not very much active nonprofits or government taking action towards self-harm. So content uh, specific to those countries uh, are missing. And why would we would need those information? Because, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the reason of self-harm in different countries are different. We need to understand those reasons and identify the resources which is needed to convey um, uh, you know, and uh, convey, and for that, a detailed research is required. Hence, uh, um, uh, you know, the bigger challenge is to uh, the lack of individuals, uh, lack of experts in writing the content, and the second one currently is lack of resources too. Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing that there's quite a few questions bubbling up in the chat, and I saw that there was one regarding guidelines. Tina, would you like to weigh in here? You are muted. Hi. Uh, could you repeat the question? Which one? We see we have several. Look, I'm looking at the question from Natasha from 4.09 a.m. my time. Would there be guidelines somewhere on how to write about suicide? And just keep a note to everyone on the Etherpad and also on, this, on the um, channel. I am documenting all the notes. We are trying to prioritize what intersects. Yes. So we actually do have notes and guidelines on how to write about suicide. Uh, and we will share those too with folks uh, who are interested. Uh, our emails are on the, so my email is on the um, page, the event page, I'll drop it here. Um, but yeah, just uh, send me an email and I will uh, send the guidelines at, to folks who want them. All right, thank you, Tina. Um, before we move into the next slide, I wanna give a moment, Praveen, for you to chat about the SPIF Foundation Paint Your Blues campaign and the impact on raising awareness about mental health and suicide in India and around the world. Sure. Um, so, um, you know, Paint Your Blues uh, was a campaign started by um, Suicide Prevention India Foundation. It's an India-based nonprofit working, you know, in terms of um, building more awareness related to uh, mental health and uh, uh, encouraging people to seek help. 
Uh, one of the issues which we have seen uh, is people don't seek help when it comes to mental health. There's a big stigma around that. And especially after COVID-19, the issue of uh, you know, stress, anxiety is high in the society. So we identified this as uh, you know, one of the opportunities where we could work with uh, an organization who, who are uh, you know, really active on ground in creating content and identifying, uh, you know, the gap in general. So, um, you know, as a result, um, we thought, you know, it would be a, a campaign where we could, uh, you know, gather images. Uh, we can generate images through different artists by working with them um, in general. And, and uh, we know that a single image can convey a thousand words and has a power to increase awareness, spur people to action and change opinions. So. When it comes to mental health imageries uh, or even the content, uh, both are, you know, both lacks in Wiki, in, in Wiki world in general. Um, images have a large influence on attitude formation and uh, perception of views, uh, but most images promote negative stereotypes, what is currently circulating, you know, on internet, reinforce stigma and discouraging mental health conversation and hinder self, uh, you know, Self-seeking. So, Art for Good uh, was a campaign, you know, that it started uh, in December 2021 with an ambitious aim to build the world's largest repository of um, mental health imagery. Um, these uh, uh, basically, we build these imageries with the help of uh, artists. There were more than 50 uh, artists across India who participated and have uh, created more than 100 imageries. The imageries, uh, the, the, the art which uh, is currently shown, you know, in this presentation uh, is the outcome from, from Art for Good campaign. And uh, uh, basically, these were created uh, so that uh, this can be free to download, distribute images, will seek, uh, you know, to leverage the popularity of memes, cartoons, illustration, infographics, and also the enduring powers of photos to support text-based narrative, which is there in Wikipedia. And it is highly encouraged, you know, in India to the media industry to use these arts uh, and not use the graphic, um, uh, you know, picture to depict <coughs> like to, to show mental health or mental illness in general. Thank you so much, Raveen. Before moving to the next slide, I would like to ask, the qu a question that was bubbled up on the chat. What about establishing a free psychological line for all Wikimedians like Wikimedia France does? This helped a lot during lockdown, especially for underrepresented minorities. Tina, would you like to weigh in? Sure. So it's kind of tricky because we have readers around the world. So when we try to help our community, we try to help our global community. I know, Stella, maybe you can speak to the trust and safety resources and peer support work um, that's happening around the world. Uh, I'm not personally familiar with the Wikimedia France example, but we're definitely interested to hear more. So uh, again, I'll, I'm happy to drop, drop my email for if uh, someone would like to chat more about this. All right, um, Natasha, would you like to weigh in with a few words about Wikimedia France before I give some details into our emergency workflow? Yes, so uh, because there was quite a lot of problems for underrepresented communities, and that was a lot of LGBT persons on the Francophone Wikipedia, um, Wikimedia France established a psychological support first as a test for four months, I think, with a psychologue who, was, um, who knew about uh, LGBT questions in general. That was pretty much used. And now it has established a 24-hour round-the-clock service where, where any uh, person contributing to the yeah. Francophone community or member Wikimedia France can uh, call take an appointment and get psychological support. So I'm not speaking about readers. Uh, I'm not speaking about uh, readership there, but people who contribute. And uh, if we want a better representation 
of minorities and underrepresented communities throughout the world, we have to bear in mind that these people are often the subject of microaggressions, which might not be labeled as cyber harassment or harassment and might fall beneath the red line, but can be very, very bearing in the long run, which is why having a, a service addressing these issues is uh, really helpful, I think. I can weigh in a bit about how we currently provide resources for people who are going through mental health crises or just episodes in general. Right now, Trust and Safety maintains a 24-hour emergency at protocol in which writers, contributors, or Wikipedians are encouraged to write in if they observe behavior that could become evidence of real-time harm or like physical harm offline, as well as just threats in general. A lot of what we receive in that workflow do, does have to do with suicide or self-harm. So we receive an email in which we believe a user is in real and present danger or maybe self-harming. We will ask, we will work to interpret what the harm is and then based on research, send it to the appropriate law enforcement agency within their region. I'm glad to hear the community is working on this. We also know that some languages of Wikipedia have added suicide hotlines, and that is really great to hear. Um, with that said, let's move into the next slide, Praveen. All right, let's talk about health misinformation on Wikimedia projects. I'd love to start off with Dr. Horton and your experience working on health misinfo as well as disinformation and the differences. Just first off, the, as I mentioned just now, the words misinformation and disinformation are used interchangeably. Could you briefly explain to our audience what the difference between those two things are? Um, yes, thank you very much, Stella. And um, yes, I mean, if we're talking about misinformation, you are talking about um, deliberately false information, um, or perhaps you're even talking about somebody who it could be even somebody who's made an error, who doesn't understand that what they've said is is actually wrong, or unintentionally said something wrong. Um, if you're talking about disinformation, it's a much more deliberate thing, um, and it's also a little bit more sinister. Uh, disinformation does not have to be necessarily false, um, but it, it seeks to divide and confuse. Um, it seeks to um, basic, basically um, insert into um, a sentence of, 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 or a series of what may be rational um, uh, information, it will insert something that is deliberately there to confuse, which may be false, or it may simply be a wrong direction. Um, certainly, that's how I would dif uh, differentiate between the two. Um, I don't know if that was what you were expecting. No, that was great. Um, based on my limited experience with misinfo and disinfo, it tracks of like experience that I have. Um, the other thing that I've heard is that it's used to deliberately elicit a strong emotion or a call to action for information that might be intentionally or unintentionally false. So it could be that you're sharing it yes. and you don't intentionally mean for it to be fake, but it could also be you're sharing it because you intentionally know that the information is not rooted in reality. Just going deeper into that, what are some effective ways to address this problem, either misinformation or disinformation? Okay, um, if I can say a little bit more then um, about the, um, if I'll talk more about the, dis the disinformation. Um, if we're, we're talking about somebody who is deliberately trying to, as you say, either elicit a, a, a reaction that, um, in the way that you've described, or somebody who is deliberately trying to slip in an untruth to get somebody confused, to get someone to believe something that may be um, actually false, but they wanted them to believe it as true. Um, and when the point being that when people are confused or when they are divided, which is the other thing that disinformation does, disinformation, um, will tend to, uh, is part of what we call culture wars. So it's trying to find um, an enemy out there, maybe a fake enemy, but somebody that people can see as an enemy and therefore get a um, take on a viewpoint that they wouldn't otherwise um, take. And when people are confused and divided, they start to doubt the information that they get. So even when the truth is then staring them in the face, 
they start to doubt it, they don't believe it, and they may act accordingly. Um, and this is certainly an experience that we've had here in the UK, and I will just briefly talk about, about COVID here, where we have seen this become a, at a political, in the context of political organisation. So we have seen the same accounts who will tweet or post um, COVID disinformation, um, who will also be posting on uh, political issues here in the UK. They tend to be the pro-Brexit accounts here, and they also um, have been linked to climate change denial accounts. So what we have we have noted is that there's some kind of organised um, disinformation here around, in this case, around COVID and, and health. Um, this is it's potentially different from what you sometimes hear when you hear um, that um, people have posted um, about, uh, you know, taking um, drinking bleach for example will cure COVID which is clearly false and um, this is not what, what I'm really talking about here I'm talking about a deliberate attempt to kind of subvert people's thoughts and it looks like it, it could be coming from an organized direction I just wanted to sort of highlight that um, I think the way to address it one of the best most effective ways to address it is to challenge it and to call it out and to repeat the truth and that is quite difficult because it's it doesn't always appear in a, in a straightforward way. It appears, it appears randomly in people's timelines. So how do you do that? By maybe responding to those posts when you see them um, and challenging them and calling out what they're saying and calling out the falsehoods and the lies and the distortions in that information um, and informing people with the truth is the other way is the other way to do it. Um, in terms of a policy response, it's, it's, it's very tricky because you then get back into the situation of, well, how does the law decide what, where, how it's going to deal with this stuff? Um, if you're dealing with the content, then the law would have to actually deal with the organised side of it, I think. And that's a personal view rather than the actual content as it appears online. Okay. I would love to hear a bit about the intersection of this from Dr. Hussein. Given your training as a physician and neuroscientist, could you describe your work on COVID-19 misinformation and how the community came together to address it, given the scientific community knew so little about it initially? I'd love to hear about that from your perspective, specific lens. Um, so COVID-19, it was a healthcare emergency, and it was a new disease, and the scientific community knew too little about it. There were no textbooks, there were no past guidelines that we could use to tackle the pandemic. So the situation was kind of a chaos when people see that their loved ones have the disease, and they don't have enough information about it, even from the institutions. The World Health Organization, the CDC and different governments tried to put out as much information as possible, but then there was so much unknown about the pandemic. So this created a kind of panic um, among people and people wanted to like just try to get whatever information they could about the pandemic. And the first thing what like regular people with internet access do is to go to the internet and check what, what this is about. And then sooner or later, they would land upon Wikipedia because we are one of the largest um, health providers of healthcare information on the internet. And on Wikipedia, they could just um, um, see uh, the status of the current status of how scientific information evolves around COVID-19 which I think was a great resource because at that time, um, because the, uh, due to the panic that's happening all over the world, people were really in need of information. And we had a bunch of really very good experts, plus a lot of other editors and um, experienced Wikimedians coming together and writing articles and updating articles related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and at points we had um, very high view, um, when we looked at the view statistics of certain COVID-19 articles, it was like 
record number of views that these articles related to COVID-19 got, not just in English, but also in several regional languages. Um, we do have like more than 200, in two, more than 200 languages, we do have articles related to COVID-19. Um, and these articles are still being developed by our editors. And I think that it was, it just really showed how powerful our community is when it comes to like coming together and building something very quickly um, by using content from all over the world in multiple languages. And this is something which even large institutions cannot like accomplish to do. It's only something that a crowdsourced enterprise like Wikipedia can do. And I'm really proud of the work that the whole community has done when it comes to COVID-19. <laughs> And when it comes to my own work, uh, I mostly focused on the knowledge gaps related to COVID-19. So the larger articles related to COVID-19, they were taken care of. But when you talk about different socioeconomic aspects of COVID-19, such as mental health in COVID-19, you did not have a specific article for that. Then I just went in and created that article and worked on it, uh, giving a country related um, specifics on how mental health uh, related to mental health is being affected in India related to COVID-19, for example. So dividing it in terms of how it happens in different countries. I also wrote about stigma related to COVID-19. Uh, so these are, so I wrote all these satellite articles, which, which are, which were not given so much attention at that moment because it was the main COVID-19 related articles that were being edited by a very many number of people. When it came to misinformation, I have a story to share. I um, One day I was just looking through the newspaper and I saw that there was an Indian family which ate a poisonous fruit, thinking that it would prevent them from getting COVID-19. And they got this information from social media. Um, so it was, I knew that there was a lot of misinformation circulating because um, at that time I was practicing as a doctor in a primary care setup and I would see a lot of patients and all of them would have their own ideas of how COVID-19 is transmitting and thus like eating garlic help uh, prevent COVID-19 or um, so they, they had people had a lot of assumptions on how COVID-19 is spreading and um, um, the treatment methods that are used for that. So uh, then I understood that misinformation is a real thing and we need to do something related to that. And that was how I went into writing misinformation related articles about COVID-19. And now we, we do have some really good content related to misinformation, but I think that what we have is only a tip of the iceberg because there is only so much that we can find related to misinformation that is surfacing on the internet, but there is much more that is being shared privately on social media. Um, and right now we only have misinformation related articles in a bunch of languages. Um, we do really need more of those articles in uh, many different languages that Wikipedia has. Um, um, and similarly, this was also the case with the vaccination information when government started rolling out COVID-19 vaccines and started giving vaccinating people. People were just so confused as to whether to take the vaccine or not, or whether they should like take the booster doses or which commercial product they have to use. There, there were different companies offering different kinds of vaccines. So um, then at that time on Wikipedia, it was very important to uh, make sure that the vaccine related articles are updated and also to uh, map the existing knowledge gaps related to vaccines and vaccine safety and show that show the current scientific information um, related to um, safety of vaccines and efficacy of vaccines. So this was also something that I worked with. And coming back to your question about how my background helped in um, this venture. Um, yeah, I was, I'm, I'm trained as a medical doctor and I have a PhD in neuroscience. Um, so, and I also had a lot of experience writing similar Wikipedia articles before. So when all this experience came together, um, it was, it, it was, it felt very natural for me to go ahead and create all these articles so that, so as to help people educate more about the pandemic as well as COVID, uh, as well as uh, the vaccines um, yeah, at that time. Um, but um, on other days, I usually write about whatever that interests me. I have also worked related to the gender gap and improving um, um, the content of um, biographies of female persons on Wikipedia. But um, when an emergency came, I just wrote what was, I just, Hopped, up, hopped in and did what was needed at that time. And I think this is very 
this is what most Wikimedians do. When they think that there is something that's happening, there's a knowledge gap that needs to be fixed. They just come in and they coordinate with each other. They create Wiki projects and they work together and build something awesome that people cannot individually do by themselves. And I think I really want to like um, show, I'm, I'm really proud of the power of collaboration that we have uh, in the Wikimedia moment. All right, one last question before we move to the next topic. Um, you, you touched on this quite a bit in your answer previously, just about proactively creating content where it didn't exist in order to battle the misinfo and disinfo that was prevalent across the entire web during the onset of the pandemic. But I wanted to just drill in, a, drill in a bit more there. As a Wikipedian, how would you describe misinformation on projects with respect to health information and other important issues such as the gender gap? So taking a step back from COVID and thinking about other topics, what is your take on that? We do have disinformation and misinformation uh, on um, Wikimedia. I think when it comes to like main articles related to say COVID-19 or stroke or Alzheimer's disease, there are a lot of people editing, there are a lot of people watching that article. So it's less likely that misinformation content comes in and sticks in there. But when it comes to articles that are not so popular, not so read by a lot of people, there can be misinformation, which is there. And um, this could probably stick on because uh, not many experts are reading that article very often and not many editors are updating that article. And the disinformation that we see on Wikipedia could be a propaganda. There are people who want to show that, say, vaccines are causing autism and they want to push their propaganda and they're using Wikipedia to like um, use unreliable references um, and, slight, and try and uh, insert that in vaccine-related articles to show that the vaccines are potentially harmful. And there are uh, there is misinformation where people give undue weight to actual facts. So some vaccines contain traces of aluminium, and people would like would give undue weight to that fact just to show that probably vaccines are not that safe and so forth. And there are also some people who are just playfully editing. They they, they are just playful and they they just want to edit and delete parts of articles. They just want to put in their own names. They they want to vandalize content. So there is this kind of misinformation also happening. And on the other hand, there are also like very innocent people who really want to give information to the world. But on the other hand, they are having false information in their arsenal. So um, they really do believe that uh, vaccines are lethal and they want to sincerely spread that information to the rest of the world and they use Wikipedia for that. So regardless of the intention, whether it's if it's misinformation on Wikipedia, then we have this um, um, we are being peer reviewed every day on Wikipedia. There are people who are reading it and Every, and anybody can edit Wikipedia. And if you see that there is a misinformation out there, you could actually go in and challenge that information on the talk page, or you could remove that information right away. Um, so we do have really very good policies on Wikipedia to tackle misinformation. Uh, but when it comes to articles that are not given so much um, uh, eyeballs, the in articles which are not read that often, um, there could be misinformation that is creeping in. And I think this is where um, many volunteer editors have to focus. We could watch list some of the articles so that if any new changes happen on vaccine related or COVID-19 related articles, we could so that we could revert that changes made by that particular editor. Um, we could also track the behavior of um, editors who have been regularly vandalizing articles. We could use, a lot, we could use technology to find out which of the editors, uh, which of the edits done by um, a certain editor is harmful and which of the edits are good. Um, we could have like um, groups in communities where we discuss about misinformation policies and how we effectively ta uh, tackle the misinformation problem. And we could also have repositories of reliable sources where we could um, like where we could cross check and see that look, uh, this is a reliable resource and this is not. Um, so there are so there is so much work that is that should be done on Wikipedia in order to uh, tackle the misinformation pandemic. But when you compare Wikipedia with the rest of the rest of the internet, say social media, we are far ahead and we have 
since to since it's a, since we started in 2001 we have been facing the misinformation problem and the rest of the world identified this problem much later and we were tackling this information like as early as in 2001 when the world trade center collapse happened um and the rest of the world was actually following the wikipedia's example of like finding reliable sources and uh, um, tackling vandalism um, so we have done a good job, but I think we have to continue keep evolving and um, use technology and our volunteer workforce uh, to better tackle more misinformation. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Very appreciated and very good to hear that it looks like we've been on the forefront of tackling misinformation for quite a long time. Let's advance to the next slide. I'd love to hear about best practices about writing health information versus Wikimedia policies. Um, Praveen, would love to hear from you first. Could you tell us about the role internet resources like Wikimedia projects have in preventing individuals from dying by suicide? Yep. Um, um, am I audible? Sorry. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. So, um, yeah, the uh, I just wanted to put the world So sorry, it seems like we're having a bit of audio issues, Praveen. I'm unfortunately unable to hear you. I'm going to give it a brief pause. We all know the internet is quite a beast to tackle, especially in these online spaces. Um, Praveen, we will come back to you. I'd like to pivot over to Dr. Hussein to talk about techniques or lessons to address COVID-19 and gender misinformation and how that applies to the overall picture of mental health information on the Wikimedia projects. Could you give some thoughts there? I think there is a lot that we can do on Wikipedia in terms of writing in a person-centered way, in uh, in a way uh, that is not overtly too academic, in a way that resonates with the reader. Um, I have some experience in doing this from uh, my work related to gender gap. So we had uh, the first step in here is to identify how identify the writing style that we are adopting to write suicide related articles so on in when it came to gender gap there was a lot of research that showed how we differently portray men and women how we usually give undue weight to women when it comes to their marriage and their family when but when it comes to men we mostly write about their career and their achievements when it comes to women we uh, we usually tended to write more about um, uh, to generalize stuff and when when uh, we wrote about men we usually gave more um, more weightage to um, uh, we, we did not assume things about them and we um, we just gave them the benefit of doubt so there were so many differences in the way we um, wrote articles which was evident in the research that came afterwards and in the light of this research we created guidelines about how to write about women and now uh, I think mm, after like 10 to 15 years of doing this kind of work, it, it just feels plain wrong to um, write differently about women. So it has been inculcated into our culture and we are more aware of how, how not to discriminate when we write articles, even though that came uh, unconsciously earlier on. So now we are consciously trying to not write differently about women. I think the same approach can be done when it comes to writing about suicide related articles. Um, there are many, very many organizations that provide um, guidelines about how to write about suicide in a person centered way. Um, and we could follow, we could uh, incorporate all these guidelines into our Wikimedia um, when we write about uh, suicide related content on Wikimedia. Um, then um, when we write about biographies, it would be important to focus more about the person. Say, uh, if we are writing about a person who ended their life, we should not give undue weight to that uh, particular incident, and we should more focus on the person. And we should also not give more, we should not also not sensationalize um, suicide-related content, but just give 
plain descriptions about what has happened. We should not provide overtly graphic uh, descriptions of how some person entered their life. We should um, just say the plain truth and in very simple words. Um, and um, I think we should also remember that um, Wikipedia is not there to like um, to be a memorial site just to provide uh, just to uh, show that this person died of suicide, but we have to more focus about their accomplishments on what else they have done in their life and so forth. Um, so there is a lot that we can do in terms of creating guidelines to write on content related to suicide. And uh, right now we already have a lot of policies in place. We have the policy of having the uh, putting only verifiable content on Wikipedia. So we can avoid taking all these articles from these um, um, news channels which sensationalize um, uh, suicide. We could, uh, so we, we, if, if only we only use um, verifiable content on Wikipedia, I think a, a lot of the problem is solved in that way. Just that, just that the verifiable sources are usually um, very particular about using person-centered language. And um, so the policies that we already have on Wikipedia are really very good. We just have to build on those policies to create guidelines to um, write about uh, suicide on Wikipedia. And I think we need a more um, interest from the volunteer community to participate in creating these guidelines. We already have a uh, like, um, draft and framework of all these guidelines from the Wikimedia Foundation, but we need more participation from the volunteer side um, to build up this. Um, when it came to gender gap, um, the field that I worked before, um, there was a lot of volunteer participation in the end, and there is still a lot of editathons, a lot of discussions, still research that is happening in this area. And I want the same to um, happen when it comes to suicide and mental, mental health related content as well. Thank you so much. Um, before we move to the next topic, Tina, would you like to weigh in on the question that was originally for Praveen? Could you tell us about the role internet resources like Wikimedia projects have in preventing individuals from dying by suicide? Yes, so as Dr. Hussein mentioned, Wikipedia is one of the most visited health information sites uh, on online. And research shows that, you know, it's important that content moderation policies, I'm gonna speak a little bit more broadly now, um, should be developed with local perspectives and in local terms because people have different understandings of harm based on their lived experience. So the wonderful thing about Wikipedia is that, you know, and Wikimedia projects generally is that they are available in 300 languages. We have people from around the world with different lived experiences, editing, challenging uh, different points of view and really making sure that articles are supported by reliable sources. So I think, you know, as research changes, having a community that's committed to accuracy and neutrality um, and sharing what they experience as harm is, uh, is critical to addressing mental health around the world. In light of COVID-19, there's been a renewed interest in mental health, uh, there's been more research, and now is really an opportunity where the community can do what it does best, um, follow the sources, and challenge whatever notions of, of, of harm um, legislators or platforms and possibly even researchers themselves. Um, again, we don't have as much, as Praveen was mentioning earlier, we don't have as much research from the global south. Uh, so challenging some of those notions. Thank you so much, Tina. Let's advance over to the next slide. All right, I'd like to open the floor for all the panelists. What do you think is the role of the projects with respect to mental health information? Let's start with you, Dr. Horton. Unfortunately, we're having some audio. Okay, I can hear you now. Perfect. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry. It, it, yeah, okay. Um, the role, sorry, the role of the projects with yes. regard to uh, to mental health information. I mean, it sounds, I mean, so, uh, but you cert I mean, certainly do have a very important role in bringing, um, I was going to say bringing clarity. Um, it sounds a bit like legalistic jargon, but um, it, 
I think just listening to Dr. Hussein just now and the way that you um, that, that use, for example, verifiable sources, with the way the, the, the amount of detail that, that you go into here, I, because I think it it's about um, the way that you can challenge the, the disinformation and the misinformation about the, around, out there is about by providing the truth and by providing accurate information that people can also find. And by so I, I think that um, may well be your, your most important role. Thank you so much, Dr. Horton. Dr. Hussein, what about you? Any final thoughts? I would just amplify three points that I took um, that I have been saying in the previous conversations. Uh, first, we need more research for mapping knowledge gaps related to mental health. Um, we do have a lot of articles, they are scattered everywhere, and we need to specifically map what defects we have in each of these articles and try to fix them. Um, secondly, we need solid guidelines related to suicide related content and mental health related content as well. We do have very good policies in place, but we don't really have guidelines about how to approach mental health and suicide related articles. Um, so we, with the participation of the volunteers, we need to provide some solid guidelines, just as we have done in terms of uh, our gender gap related projects. We um, really need a community uh, to take over this issue and create some guidelines for editors to think about when they write about mental health and suicide related content. Thirdly, we need more volunteer participation in this area, including expert participation. Um, our volunteers, most of them, um, they might not be experts in uh, mental health, but they try, they are very interested in that area and they write articles. And we also have a small group of experts who also contribute to these articles. We need more expert um, participation so that the, our articles are more structured and they are, um, they are more understandable to a general audience and they are presented in um, with a diverse, enriched content. We also need uh, volunteers in different languages to write articles um, related to mental health in our 300 plus languages. I have been an editor in, I have been editing in Malayalam language Wikipedia, which is my mother tongue. And there is too little content related to mental health on, in Malayalam language. So we need uh, editors in all different languages to amplify the content related to mental health. Um, as well as uh, to provide expert advice and um, expert input into all these articles so that, so that they remain verifiable and up to date. Thank you so much. Praveen and Tina, could you also give your thoughts? Sure, I think in this world where internet um, uh, you know, usage is growing exponentially, uh, uh, and people are seeking uh, health information online, I think there's a great role uh, for the community to come forward, um, you know, and build a mental health uh, uh, repository, not just in English, but as Dr. Hussain said, in all regional languages. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that this communities have an opportunity to increase access to knowledge on uh, mental health and suicide prevention as a key impact subject. Thank you so much. Tina, how about you? Okay, so writing about mental health responsibly is a complex task. Um, so we're not gonna solve this issue in this panel, but regulators and governments around the world are trying to, to be direct police harmful content. And some of this content includes important health information. Unfortunately, they're taking the same approach that larger tech companies have taken is apply a policy often based in the US to communities around the world instead of taking the perspective of communities into account. So my takeaway from this is that Wikipedians keep doing what you're doing, stay curious, follow the sources, challenge what governments around the world say, but, uh, but also be mindful of emerging research that identifies some content as being indeed harmful and explore the tensions between censorship and best practices uh, and be sure to be mindful of how what we write about, what we write on Wikipedia may affect those that you may not have thought would have been affected. All right, before we use the last five minutes to open up for questions, Praveen, I would like to give you the floor to talk about your work with Art for Good. Thank you, Stella. Um, 
So uh, as I mentioned before, Art for Good uh, was a campaign uh, inviting you know all the artists um, in India to come forward and create art around uh, mental health, which can detox and destigmatize uh, uh, you know the behavior of not seeking help. Uh, and in collaboration with Suicide Prevention India Foundation, uh, we reached out to the art, artist communities in India. There are more than 50 uh, you know, artists who participated, who understand mental health from a background of psychology uh, uh, you know, to someone who has seen loss in their family or who was going through the mental uh, you know, health state themselves have participated in this context. Uh, in this context. Um, and this campaign to build an uh, image repository which is available on commons for all. So uh, that was that was all and moreover with this uh, you know, initiative, I think it is one of the example which we wanted to do, uh, which we wanted to set with the communities where we work with different partners who are engaging day in and day out on mental health and suicide prevention specific topic and they have got great uh, uh, you know expertise in these areas and somehow uh, you know uh, at this collaboration we are able to build our uh, our information repositories with the help of collaborations uh, uh, you know with the help of uh, collaboration between two different communities and organization i think we can build more uh, information uh, around mental health and suicide prevention on wiki projects in general which will be useful for Thank you so much, Praveen. All right, five minutes remaining, and we have a couple questions on the docket for our presenters. The first one is going to be, when a Wikimedian is accused of adding illegally harmful content by a government, how does the foundation communicate that to the editor? If the information added is illegal in the US, but illegal in the editor's jurisdiction, what requirements, if any, bind the foundation and the editor? Tina, would you like to take this one? Sure. So as we discussed with respect to the applicable law determination, it varies a lot. And we evaluate these cases on a case-by-case -case basis, but always taking into account human rights. So that's something um, that is, is very important to us. Um, but we do try to support communities as much as we can. We try to work with the volunteer communities and communicate to the extent allowed by law and uh, the, taking into account the safety and of the community as well as the risks to the foundation. Thank you so much. Next question, as these tend to revolve around the legal aspect of this work, I will be allowing for Tina to take the first stab, but if any of the other panelists want to weigh in, that's absolutely okay. The next one is the meaning and trade-offs in human rights law will often depend upon case law and may only be determined through legislation. Does Wikimedia interpret case law in making such judgments? Clearly a time-consuming activity. And what will Wikimedia do when the case law is unclear and may only be clarifiable through court proceedings? And I've attached it in the chat as well. Well, we do our, the analysis to the best we can, but we often work with local expert counsel to evaluate each case. And if we decide to take a case, we also hire outside counsel who has that expertise. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tina. Are there any other questions that people want to bubble up in the chat as I go through the etherpad? All right, let me find one last question here. And this one I'd like to open to any panelists who would like to take it. To my mind, the interests of mental health practitioners and those who may be treated by them are not necessarily aligned. An example is that interventions taken to reduce the immediate risk of suicide in the short term may increase long-term risks while providing a practitioner with a sense of having tried to do something. Literature directly targeting services 
use service users may hide information and mislead re users. Um, how can the value of expert knowledge be traded off with implicit bias and distrust that a focus on suicide prevention could create, potentially pushing readers to forums that are less regulated and having less regard for the truth? This will be our last question before we all say goodbye today. Would anyone like to weigh in? I will just say that this is where Wikipedia has an important role is to help folks who don't have the medical expertise ask the right questions, know when their practitioners might be biased. Oh, yeah. I will pass this on to Dr. Hussein because she is a physician. This is a very difficult question to answer. I don't really have a concrete answer for this question. Uh, for example, on Wikipedia, Wikipedia is not exactly a forum. We just mirror the information that is presented on different reliable sources and we just show it on um, our platform. So it's not actually a forum where you can ask questions about your mental health and get answers from an expert and so forth. So it's the, it's the information that's there. And I recently looked uh, into the article about suicide methods on English Wikipedia, and I saw that um, there are 7,500 people, approximately 7,500 people per day reading that article. And I'm pretty sure that some of them who are reading the article are ideating about suicide, and they probably would take their own life. A, a small minority of them would probably take their own life in the future. So we do provide this kind of content on our websites. And from a Wikimedian's perspective, I think that we cannot censor the information. People who are ideating about taking their own life will try and find out a way to do that anyway, even though Wikimedia doesn't provide that kind of information. So we'll have to Thank balance you so much, Dr. Hussein. So sorry. Just wanted to gently tag that we are at time. Um, I would love for you to provide your written thoughts as well as we follow up with everyone in Meta. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time to attend today's session. Again, really appreciate our panelists and we will be looking to answer any questions that we missed asynchronously. Thank you again, everyone for attending today's session. Tina provided her email in the chat as well. So if you wanna get in touch with her or any of our other panelists through her, please feel free to send her an email. But thank you everyone. Um, we can consider this session adjourned. Thank you.